Good morning, church family. I want to say I was gone last week and I missed you guys. And I want to say that last week, when Scott was sitting up here making fun of me, giving me a hard time about how good it is to have me gone and all that, I was watching the whole time. And I also want to say,
say when he messed up the sound system and had all the feedback, y'all remember that? I was back there on the phone with Ayla, fixing his mess. Fixing him his mess all the way from Utah. Huh? I don't know, yeah. I love her church. I love her pastor. I don't like picking on him. And I like it that he dishes it back. But I love my church family. And I love worshiping with you. So if you would, let's stand and worship this morning.
encourage you with before we go into prayer. Uh, sunflowers. We plant sunflowers in our garden and around the house every summer. This summer we did not do that. Uh, we planted a whole bunch last year and they dropped a bunch of seed and they came up by themselves so we didn't have to plant any. Unfortunately the goats got out and ate them all. This is one reason why I wish that our goat herd would just find another home. But that's okay. Um, we are learning great lessons from being goat shepherds. Um, anyway, they ate all the sunflowers except for one. 
There was one that came up all by itself from, I, it must be a couple years. I don't know how this seed fell where it did, but it grew up right along my garden fence. And I saw it there when I was weeding one day. So I cleared around it and let it grow. And it was about a couple feet, a couple feet tall. And Scott and I were out walking, I walking past it and I realized it had fallen. I don't know if the cucumbers, like they were tre trellising up the stem of it. I don't know if they pulled it down, probably not, but somehow it fell. I've got four kids, they ride a four wheeler and a gator everywhere. It happens, things happen. Um, and as we were out walking, I walked past it and I noticed that it had bloomed. Now I had weeded around this thing, I had weeded around it. I thought it was dead. There was like a third of the stem still attached and fallen over, but part of it was just barely there. And I didn't realize it was still alive. I was just lazy and ignored it and let it lie and just weeded around it. Um, but as we were on that walk, I kept thinking about the sunflower, like how did it, how is it possible that thing bloomed? It was flipped over with a beautiful yellow bloom facing the sun. It was around noon, okay? Now sunflowers are super hardy, okay? They, they um, can grow up to 30 feet tall. I Googled was the, the tallest sunflower. And I've got some more facts here. The seed head, if you've ever seen the, if you look closely, it's made up of a bunch of tiny little flowers on the inside. And almost every portion of the sunflower is useful. Oil, the sunflower seeds dye, like you can eat part of it. Um, and it can actually um, absorb toxins in the air. And they even have their own internal clock. Their blooms follow the sun, if you've noticed this before, if you've grown sunflowers. The blooms follow the sun all day long, and then during the night, they reset themselves to face east again. So they can follow the sun all day long and reset and face east. So during our walk, I kept thinking about that sunflower, and it was so encouraging to me, because how many times have you felt like that sunflower lying on the ground? You're still alive, but you look like you're, you're just down, okay? Um, I've been there. So even when we're knocked down by life, we're knocked down by pain, he is constant like the sun. Yes, he is constant like the sun. He will continue to come day after day after day to strengthen you. And you can still bloom. He's not done with you. You can still bloom. You can still grow. You can still find strength, okay? You may be misshaped. That uh, flower head was like kind of shriveled and a little bit weird looking. It wasn't perfectly round. How many of us have been misshaped by life? How many of us have scars? How many of us have brokenness in our lives? Guess what? God's not done. He's not done with you. And one more thing. People may think that you are too far gone. Like I thought about that sunflower, I thought that thing's not going to live. It had just a little bit of that stem attached. But thankfully, people, people's opinions of us do not matter. God's opinions of us matters. Okay? Our strength is found in him. Our security is found in him. Our identity is found in him. He is the one who made you. He formed you. And last thing, please don't try to get up by yourself. If you feel broken, if you are in the dark right now, if you are sad, if you are angry, however you may find yourself this morning, if you don't want to be here, but somehow you made it here, don't try to get it by yourself. He gives us his spirit. He says, even if you make your bed in hell, I am with you. You know, you can be in heaven, you can be in hell, but my spirit is with you. Matthew 11 says that my burden is easy. My yoke is light. Switch that around. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And he wants to work with you. He wants to help you. Don't do it yourself. Don't lose faith. You're not damaged goods. He's still working. His spirit is still going with you. 
our culture praises DIY, right? I love DIY. I love building things myself. I love doing things myself. I want to listen to the next podcast, of, listen to the next speaker. Um, but that that's not how God works. We can't do it ourselves. We can't muster up enough faith or, or try to move on to the next thing to try to grow, to try to make our heart change. We can't change our hearts ourselves. He is the one that can do it. Don't try to do it on your own. So we're going to go to prayer. And I want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus. Bring your request to him. Be honest in your prayer with him. And don't forget that he is there just like that sunflower watches the sun. Let's keep our eyes on the sun, right? Let's keep our eyes facing him. So uh, we have a few people that we need to pray for. Um, I know Becky Lancaster, she lost her dad a few weeks ago so we keep her and her family in our prayers um leslie chrisman want to keep you and your family in prayers if you lost your brother is there anyone else that we can lift up in prayer this morning yes houston uh, my great aunt is in some kind of breathing machine and um she has to go tomorrow to start breathing on her own starting to get better but um if you just want to get better by I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Pastor Rico, what about Pastor Rico? His father passed, His father passed away. Okay. Yes. Anyone else? Becca, would you continue to pray for my mom and yes. um, and Steve, <laughs> Carol yes. and Steve? Yes. Um, they're still trying to figure out what's um, going on with my mom's heart. They're going to have to have a pacemaker put in and yeah. He's still recovering as well. Okay. Yes. For sure. Someone, Debbie? Uh, we're going to ask that Father Jasper. Um, I think he's going into pneumonia. They're doing tests today. And I've been fighting something for over a week. And I think I'm just run down. I just need prayer. Yes. I have three boys about to. Never alone. We are never alone. Yes. Anyone? Anyone? Pastor Hammond? Our United States of America. Yes, sir. stand up. We've been sitting a while. Let's stand up. We'll say the Lord's Prayer together. And um, there were a few that asked just for personal needs for Debbie and Min, um, for Taylor. If there's anyone around, then let's lay hands and pray for them. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God, that you are with us. We thank you that we do not have to do this on our own. And um, Lord, we're just going to say the Lord's Prayer together 
as we begin our prayer time. So let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who have debted against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For lies is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Father, we come to you today. We place you as king of our hearts, king of our lives. We thank you for your lordship in our lives, Lord. And we put you in right standing. And God, I ask for those of us in our congregation and friends of our congregation that are going through grief right now as they're grieving loved ones that have passed away, I pray for their families and their friends, Lord. I ask for special peace and comfort to surround them. I pray, God, that in their questions that you would be faithful, that they would find their trust and strength in you in this time. God, we ask for your healing touch on Houston's aunt who is in a breathing machine right now. Lord God, I, I pray that you would strengthen her. I pray for your healing hand to be upon her, that she would cure this disease within her body in Jesus' name, that she would be able to breathe on her own. And we pray for Kaylee, Kaylee's friend Clayton's grandfather, Lord, who is in the hospital. I ask that you would touch his body, Lord, that you would give him strength. Strengthen him, I ask in Jesus' name. And be with Clayton as he's having a hard time after losing his grandmother, that you would help him to trust in you and find his strength in you, Jesus. And we also pray for Pastor Rico's father, uh, the family of their father who's passed away, Lord God. I, I pray the same for them, Lord, that you would give them comfort in this time and peace in this time, that they would turn to you for their strength and for their peace. And we pray for Carol, Lord God, as she's recovering, and Steve, as he's recovering, and they're trying to figure out what's going on with Carol. I ask for wisdom for the doctors and for the team that's, that's working with them, Lord, for her health. I pray, God, for wisdom. I pray for healing in her body and for peace to reign in this time. In Jesus' name. We also pray for Jasper, Lord, that I, I, I pray, God, that you would strengthen him, strengthen his lungs, Lord, take away this pneumonia in Jesus' name. And we also ask for uh, Debbie, that you would touch her, this sickness she's been struggling with that won't seem to let go, Lord. I just pray that you would touch her body, that she would see a turnaround today in Jesus' name. And we also ask and lift up Carol's friend who has an appointment at the doctor, Lord God, who's may um, have something serious going on, Lord. I just pray that he would receive a good word, Lord, that you would uh, touch his body, that you would be working in that situation, that he would receive a good word from the doctor today at that appointment, Lord God. We pray for healing in Taylor's body. I ask that you would help him recover from this bronchitis, that he would be healed in Jesus' name. We pray for men, Lord, I, I ask that you would um, bring encouragement and peace into her life. Lord, that she would find her strength in you and nothing else. Um, and just the supernatural presence of God in her life, Lord God, in Jesus' name. As she is leading so many other younger people, God, I ask that you would give her strength. And Lord, we bring our nation before you. Lord, we pray for our president. We pray for this election. God, I just... Um, ask that you would help us all on both sides of these issues that we would be loving that we would show your love above all things lord let us be loving and i, I just pray for wisdom as we vote and <laughs> god i just this is just such a mess and i just pray that you would be our our god we would put you in place in our nation and everything else will figure itself out, Lord God. But we just ask for your wisdom and your moving in our nation in Jesus' name. We also ask for the Middle East, Lord God, that you would bless these people, that you would be near to these people going through such hardship, Lord God, that, that we cannot even imagine. But I just pray for your hand to be upon them in Jesus' name. And we ask for the Smithers that you would help them as they are moving Lisa's mom and all these decisions that need to be made, Lord, I ask for wisdom. I ask for your 
providence, Lord God, that you would move, that you would open doors and shut doors and guide them and give them wisdom. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with Lisa and cover her with protection as she is traveling today. And Lord, we thank you for this time that we can be together and worship you and serve each other. And we just ask that you would be with us in Acts of Harvest this afternoon, that we could make a difference in some people's lives, that we could show them your love, that they would feel your presence when they walk into this place, and they would surrender their lives and their hearts to you, Jesus, and let you lead their lives from now on. And God, I thank you that we can come here today to worship. And I ask for your presence and your Holy Spirit to cover Tom as he brings the word this morning and let our hearts be open to you so that you can bring change in us and that we can share your love with others. Be with us today, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
that little feeling that you get, that little thing that you have in your heart that you feel drawing you and convicting you, encouraging you, that little thing is called the Holy Spirit. And I would ask this morning that we open up our heart. I worship you. 
atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. For the Spirit of the Lord is here.
Spirit of the Lord is here. Every dance is so Spirit of the Lord is here. Just your voices. A miracle can happen now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. For the Spirit of the blessing to be with you all and Amen. Welcome back. well thank you it's good to be back and I hope that I'm the first name that comes to Scott's mind when he needs someone to preach when he's not here and uh, he's in my favorite national park in the whole world in Glacier National Park I looked at the uh, temperature and it's in the high 90s for the next several days so I've been praying every day for him and his team and yeah. I'm glad they're having a great time and Keep them in prayer to be safe. And it's a blessing to be with you all. And I'll need to move quickly to uh, work from here. But I'm glad to be here. I'm very happy that my lovely wife and my two lovely daughters are with us today. And this is the day that the Lord has made. This is his Sabbath day. And it's good to be with you all. Let us look at Ephesians 4, 29. And it says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. One more time. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Let us pray. Father, we thank you to be able to gather on this Holy Sabbath to lift up holy hands unto you, our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer. And Heavenly Father, we as Ryan prayed and invite the Holy Spirit to superintend of our time together. And Lord, I pray that your word will go forth to accomplish great things in every heart and mind. And Lord, I pray that everyone here, that you'll empower us to be doers and not simply hearers of your holy word. Please watch over Pastor Bowman. Yeah. Keep him and his hiking party safe. And please watch over Becca and the family here. And Lord, may this church family be blessed. In the this week and in the days to come, may you watch over this household as they this church as they retire their debt, Lord willing, soon to come. And Father, we thank you for this time. May your word be powerful in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. See if you can guess who said the following: 
My fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. John F. Kennedy, inaugural address in 1961. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I have a dream. Amen. Uh, do you believe in miracles? Sportscaster Al Michaels when the U.S. hockey team beat the Russians in 1980. The British are coming. Paul Revere. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. FDR. Everyone's been saying that. FDR, first inaugural address. Nip it in the bud. Elizabeth, I'm coming to join you. Fred G. Sanford. Do not squeeze the Charmin. Mr. Whipple. Mr. Whipple. <laughs> I didn't inhale. <laughs> words are memorable, whether good or bad. The words we speak are very important because they reveal to a large degree what is in our hearts. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And there's a great connection between the heart and and the mouth. And God doesn't want us just to reduce the amount of corrupt words we speak. He wants us to eliminate them. This is because God says, be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1 16, and be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5 48, be holy, be perfect. That's a tall order. Jesus says in Matthew 12 36, we have to give an account for every idle word we speak. An idle word is a corrupt word, a, a useless word, a wasteful word, a word that does not glorify God nor edify man. So the will of God is that we speak not one corrupt word, not one idle word. That is a tall order. It's the will of God. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit, including the fruit of self-control by which you might bridle or tame the tongue. Probably every four to six months, I preach some topic along the lines of taming the tongue because I need it. And I am blessed when I abide in it. And so, amen. And so we're going to talk about taming the tongue today. It's a great and important topic. And I have found that I have my greatest peace when I live in the parameters of taming the tongue. James 1.26 says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his own tongue, he deceives his own heart. And his religion is useless. You can teach the greatest Bible studies and lead people to Jesus. But if you fail to bridle the tongue, you deceive your own heart and your religion is useless. You can make lots of money and provide well for your household. But if you fail to bridle the tongue, you deceive your own heart and your religion is useless. You can have the noblest of intentions and the grandest of plans to do great things for God. But if you fail to bridle the tongue, you can forfeit the entire enterprise. We are called to bridle the tongue. It's like 1 Corinthians 13. Though you can fathom all mysteries and all understanding, have all faith to move mountains, but have not love, you're nothing. We must have love, and we must tame the tongue. June 14th in Lakeland, Florida, in a McDonald's drive through this these customers got furious because the drive through worker got their order wrong. And so they got into a big argument. They were yelling out of their car. She was yelling out of the drive through And the argument got so intense that they are about to drive off. She throws a drink at the car. They stop the car. This guy gets out, comes up the drive through window, and throws a drink on the lady. He gets in the car to drive away. She runs outside the McDonald's, pulls out a handgun, and starts shooting at the car is arrested for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And I have to wonder, did the argument start because she forgot fries with a Happy Meal? 
Did she fail to supersize the fries? Did she forget the McFlurry? Did she not put enough caramel on the Frappuccino? I'm being facetious because the incident is so ridiculous. Proverbs 18.6 says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. But Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers. We're not to be troublemakers or strife makers. We're to be, by the help of the Lord, peacemakers. Last two weeks ago, Saturday, my wife and my kids and I were driving to Louisville to see my uncle at my mom's house. He was in town. My brother was coming down. and I was driving. and There's a lot of construction on I-64. But on Saturday and Sunday, not so much. But the signs are still up, 55 and a 70. And so I go down to 55 miles an hour. That's what the law says. And so this car behind me gets irate. The guy is giving me these gestures because I'm going 55 and he wants to go faster. And he's making me mad. I'm getting very angry because he's giving me these gestures. I'm just obeying the law. And I say nothing. I don't say a word. I don't think my wife and kids had any idea I was even upset at all what was going on. So finally the guy got an opening and he passed me and he cut me off. But because I said nothing, I did not escalate Come on. and quench the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I was able to go in and have a great visit with my uncle and my family because I did not feed the frustration that I could feel building because the Bible says to be slow to speak and quick to listen and slow to anger. But if we're quick to speak, we can be quick to anger. So back to Ephesians 4.29. Let no sapros logos proceed out of your mouth. Logos means word. Sapros is translated in the KJV and the, in the NKJV corrupt. Let no corrupt word. The NIV translates sapros unwholesome. The rhymes translate it to evil. The amplified translates it foul and polluting. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, a sapros tree cannot bear good fruit. So it means bad. It also means bad fish in Matthew 13. So sapros means corrupt, unwholesome, evil, foul, polluting, and bad, literally and morally. So sapros conversation demoralizes and discourages. It is ungodly and it is unloving. Sapros conversation saps the joy out of the speaker and the hearers. There it is. Yeah. Now, five weeks ago, my older daughter, Emma, who's 18, graduated from International House of Prayer in Kansas City. She was there for five months. So we all went up there to be there for her graduation. And then Kim brought her car back. And Emma and I drove to Colorado and pitched a tent at Rocky Mountain National Park and went hiking for three days. And we had a great time. And so the highlight of the trip was Em and Anna were hiking a little ahead of me. They went over a hill and turned around and said, Dad, there's a bear coming. So I looked over the hill. There's a great big black bear walking toward us, but we got away, had no issues. We pray that Scott has no issues with grizzly bears. But we were inseparable for five days and had zero strife. We got along great, and we, we talked about the Lord. We talked about the Word of God. We worshiped, and we prayed together, and we had a great time together. Because when we speak God's Word, and we have gratitude in our hearts, the joy of the Lord will cause us to have unity, which is so necessary in a family. Now, one time I had to go be chaplain at a federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. That's where they had the death row. And so I had to audit the chaplain department there. And so I had to go to the lieutenant's office. Those were kind of the top cops. And I had to check files. And so I'm sitting there. And I've got about an hour's work of files to check. And some lieutenants are in there. And they're using profanity. Now, when I hear profanity, which is regular in the prisons, I usually just walk away. But I couldn't leave. And so it's getting under my skin. And this other lieutenant walks in, and he's using profanity. He takes God's name in vain. No. So I turn around, look him in the eye. Gentlemen. And they stop talking and look at me. I said, I'm Chaplain Paul. I'm doing a program review. Taking God's name in vain is just not working for me. Dead silence. 
They said nothing. I went back to work. No one said a word. And someone later apologized to me. But it saps the joy of the Lord when people are speaking ungodly. And when we do it, we're doing the same thing. And so if you speak about somebody else behind their back, and you think that you're hurting them, you're also hurting you. It's not the will of God for your life at all. And so three weeks ago, I had to tell an inmate that his son was murdered. Come to find out that son was pushing a refrigerator for the mother on a dolly outside the apartment. And some random man started talking trash. Called him a wimp and a sissy and so forth. So they got into an argument and he pulled out a gun and murdered him. Completely useless. Nothing to be gained from talking trash to somebody else. You don't know what you're going to get into with road rage these days. In this society, people packing, don't even go there. Bless those who curse you. So in Matthew 12, Jesus says we have to give an account for every idle word we speak. And the word idle is the Greek word argon, A-R-G-O-N. And A means negative and ergon means work. So argon or idle means negative work. In Matthew 20, verse 3, it's literal, speaking about men standing argon or idle in the workplace. But here, idle words, it means futile, worthless, a waste of time. We are to not speak any idle, useless, wasteful words. It does not glorify God. You have to give an account to God in the future every single idle word that you speak. Talking trash. It's all idle words. Yes, sir. It says speak words that are wholesome and impart grace, but not idle words. I mean, I thank God that He's delivered me from the sins I used to commit, but still, every day I have to contend with my mouth. Yes, sir. And it's not natural to speak righteously at all times, it takes intentionality by studying God's word that we might tame the tongue. Amen? Amen. And so it says in verse 429 that we may speak words of necessary edification. Now the word edify is oikodom in the Greek and it means to build a house. Every word we speak should build up the hearers and not tear them down. To edify means to build up, to instruct, to benefit, and to uplift. And think about how you speak on a weekly basis. Are all the words you speak building, instructing, benefiting, and uplifting? We shouldn't tear down. We shouldn't harm. We shouldn't undercut. We shouldn't backstab. We should speak, speak words that build and edify our neighbor. Amen? In Zimbabwe, true story, they held the annual Mr. Ugly contest. Yes, they had a Mr. Ugly contest. Judges were awarded $500 to the first place person who was the ugliest. And so one year they gave it to Misan Suri, age 42, citing his missing front teeth and his wide range of grotesque facial expressions. And so he beat out the crowd favorite, William Masvidu, who had won it the previous years. So Masvidu and supporters stormed the judges, saying, this is not fair, this is cheating. You only gave it to him because he has missing front teeth. He is not naturally ugly. I am naturally ugly. He said he's only ugly when he opens his mouth. And, and Sari said, oh, they're just sore losers. Can't they realize that I'm uglier than they are? I hope to get a TV contract. How bizarre is that? But Miss Venu said something profound when he said, he is only ugly when he opens his mouth. When you open your mouth, do you sometimes say things that are ugly? It's not appropriate for a Christian to speak ugly. 
We're to speak no unwholesome words, but words that edify and words that impart grace. We shouldn't speak ugly at all. It is not righteous. It is not the will of God. We'll have to give an account every time we do it. Even if it's brother and sister messing around. You don't get, a, you don't get to escape this verse. We need to speak words of grace and edification. And that's what he says here, that it may impart grace to the hearer. Now, my wife and I have been married for 22 and a half years. And we've had a great marriage. But the greatest years have been the last nine or ten years because I began to study, Lord, help me tame my tongue. And I wrote a book about it. And I began to teach it and preach it and incorporate it in the way that I speak. And therefore, our marriage has been the best when we tame the tongue. And so let your speech always be with grace, he says here at the end of, end of verse 29. Now, grace is because we are the recipients of God's grace. We have all received amazing grace from God. Grace is unearned favor, receiving blessings that you don't deserve. Think about God's grace to you on the natural level. I can't make my heart to beat. I can't make my eyes to function. I can't make my digestive system to work. If I bite into a sandwich, I don't have to think, release uh, uh, digestive juices in my stomach. No, I just live. I don't, I don't have to think to get my central nervous system to work. I don't have to think hard to walk down the street. I, I can't make the sun rise and the rain fall. I can't make the earth orbit the sun or the uh, moon to orbit the earth. I can't make these things. I can't make anything. Every part of my being is a gift. My fingernail is a gift. The hairs on my head are a gift. Everything I have is a gift from God. It's all grace. I can't make a freckle. I can't make a hair. I can't make anything. All that I have is grace from God. I'm breathing right now. I can't do that on my own. It's all God. Every bit of it. Yeah. If you think about how many blessings are in your life, and you start thanking God for everyone, you'll be thanking God for the rest of your life. And that's what we should be doing. I thank God for the trees, and the forest, and the rivers, and the mountains, and the skies, and my wife, and my children. Thank God, because everything you have is grace. Think about God's grace on the spiritual level. Ephesians chapter 2, but God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Then in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness by Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Yes. So in that passage, three times, he mentions the word grace. And he also mentions three things that he has done in the life of a believer, all past tense. He made you alive with Christ. He raised you up with Christ. And he made you sit in heavenly places in Christ. Past tense. So right now, if you're a Christian, you are positionally in Christ at the right hand of the Father. A place of victory and ruling over the devil. It's all grace. Everything we have is grace. Therefore, we should have gratitude. Not complaining. Oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. I didn't get my way here. Man, if you start writing out everything you have from God, you'd be filled with joy and gratitude. There was a man one time who was tempted to commit suicide and he met with a pastor. And the pastor had to start listing blessings in his life. He made him write them down. He got to over 100 and says, I get the point. I'm a blessed man. We're blessed people. It's all God's grace. Therefore, let your speech always be with grace. Ephesians, that's uh, Colossians 4, 6. That's a quote. Let your speech always be with grace. There's never a time we should be ungracious when we talk to somebody. Take it literally. Sometimes you may have to confront, you may have to hold accountable somebody, but still 
you can't be ungracious in what you say. I put that on a t-shirt wearing in my house. Let your speech always be with grace. If someone irritates you, like when I was driving, you can feel it coming. That sometimes happens. That might not be the time to talk. <laughs> Close the mouth. Get away. Regroup. And then when you start to speak again, it's back to grace. Yes, Let your speech always be with grace. If I speak to my wife, I'm going to speak grace. If I'm going to speak to my daughters, it's going to be grace. I realize that in every Pauline epistle, he begins and ends every epistle with a salutation of grace. Without exception. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Grace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time, which sets, tells us this, when you come together, you come in grace. When you depart, you depart in grace. Now in the body of the letter, he might rebuke. But you come in grace, and you depart in grace. And that's how we ought to be. The sun should not set on your anger. It says in Hebrews 13, 9, it is good for the heart to be established by grace. Grace should cover us in all that we do. Let your speech always be with grace. Now it says in Proverbs 15.23 a man has joy by the answer of his mouth. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth. It doesn't say that a man has joy because his spouse and neighbors treat him well. It doesn't say that a man has joy because of favorable circumstances. Now how someone treats you and having favorable circumstances can contribute to joy, but these are external to who you are. That means your joy would be based on something external. No, this verse emphasizes that you can cause joy to rise within you based on what you say. You are in control of your joy level. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth. I'm in control of my joy level. If I don't have joy, because I'm not speaking it. When you, when you speak according to Ephesians 4, 29, and you speak grace, and you show gratitude toward God, and you're not complaining, and you're not slandering your neighbor, and you're speaking grace and kindness to people, and you're speaking the word of God, you're going to have joy sure. all the time. Joy. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. It all comes because God is a good God. He is good to us. He has given us grace. He has blessed us with myriad blessings. We can't even count them all. We're the recipients of God's blessings and His salvation. And therefore, we need to be a conduit to others of that same grace, especially when we speak. You might not feel it, but hold that tongue so that when you do begin to speak, it's going to be words of grace. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the instruction that we might edify our neighbor and we might speak grace to our neighbor. Lord God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord God, our strength and our redeemer. And Lord God, we thank you for this time as we worship you. Even now, as we lift up holy hands and worship you, may we have gratitude to our gracious God.